Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I want to welcome you to this service of thanks and praise to God. And I know that uh, 2020 has been a challenging and difficult year filled with ups and downs. And we haven't always felt grateful for everything. But I want to remind us of the words of the Apostle Paul when he says in, um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Now it doesn't say feel grateful for all circumstances, but it's a command to give thanks in all circumstances. And when we give thanks, even when we don't feel like it, something happens, something happens in us. And we are reminded of the words of Romans 8, where it says, uh, God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Now, it doesn't say that all things are good, but we're reminded that God works good in all circumstances. And so when we praise God for who he is and all that he does for us, something happens in us. Our circumstances don't change, but we change. And God gets bigger and our problems get smaller. And so we're going to practice together giving thanks today. And I want to dare you, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and triple dog dare you to give thanks today and to be grateful. And we're going to allow the words of Psalm 103 to lead us in thanks. And then we're going to have a time of quiet. And if you're with a family or with a friend, uh, you can go ahead and write out loud, say, I praise you, God, for, or I thank you for. But let's listen to the words of Psalm 103 and uh, think about all the things that uh, David is grateful for. And let's, lead up. let's let that lead us. So let's pray together. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. And God, we praise, your, praise you for your abounding love. We thank you that you heal us, that you redeem us, that you crown us with love, that you satisfy our desires, that you renew our strength. Lord, there is so much to give you thanks and praise for, even in these circumstances. So let's take a moment now just to, in quiet or out loud, give thanks to the Lord. Lord, I praise you for, or I thank you for. God, we have so much to be grateful for and we thank you. And we thank you even though we don't understand everything or have worries and concerns and fears about the future and fears about the present. We thank you for who you are and that you don't change and that you are good all the time. And so we give you the praise that you deserve and we express our love to you today. And we thank you for all of your good gifts. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So again, I want to welcome you to this service. We're going to have some time to worship the Lord. We're going to hear some beautiful testimonies, have some chalk art. And uh, so just enjoy this time and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you're a good good father who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who 
So uh, we all know that this year has been probably one of the most stressful years um, with COVID happening and you know all of the other life stresses that came along with that. Um, but in the midst of all of the negativity in the world right now, um, we have to look at the bright side. Um, this ended up being one of the best years for my family. Um, I'm a teacher and prior to all of the COVID stuff happening, teaching really stressed me out. It took a lot away from myself, from my family, and it was just really hard. Um, but when the quarantine happened in the spring, it really brought my family closer together. Um, my husband works nights, and as a teacher, you know that's opposite from my schedule, so we didn't really get to see each other a lot. Um, so since we got to stay at home, we got to hang out during the day, um, do day-to-day -day activities together. So it, it really helped us grow closer together, especially with um, our daughter getting a little bit older and understanding a little bit more about what's going on in the world. 
um, we were able to grow closer to a family and talk about things that we normally wouldn't be able to talk about. Um, and it just, it ended up being one of the best times for us. Um, now that we're, I don't even know how many months into this now, what, 10, 11 months into this now, we are probably as strong as we've ever been. Um, my relationship with God has gotten a lot better um, now that I actually have time to sit down and talk to Him and pray every morning and um, read my daily verses. Um, I've actually been able to pass that on to my daughter. Since we're at home more, I can teach her more about what I know, what the Bible says. We're doing activities together. Um, this church has been amazing at providing things for us to do together at home. Um, and I just couldn't be more grateful for this. Um, with that said, I know there are a lot of people hurting because of what's going on. But that just gives us more time to pray for those people that need it the most. Um, and just to pray that God takes care of everything that's going on inside our hearts, in the world, in society, and we just have to rely more on Him. Hi everyone, my name is Demaya Bryant. My wife is Nordea Bryant, and we're here together to talk about our testimony. Um, thankfully, we've had a number of great testimonies that we can uh, share during this uh, pandemic, but uh, I know that sounds ironic because there's been some um, unique events that have occurred in our lives, but we can say that during this time, God has been phenomenal and he's been good even in those times of uh, confusion, chaos, and those sort of things. But uh, he's been consistent uh, for us and with us. So um, one of the things I want to start off by sharing is that um, during this time, I've actually been um, uh, a victim of, of the coronavirus and I've been able to survive that. And I'm very thankful to God that I'm still here and I'm thankful to my wife to having her support and love and care during that time because there was um, during this time it hasn't been just a me thing it's been an all of us thing and my wife has been my my support my care and my rock and one of the things I want to share within that is um, a scripture that I um, it started off with a scripture that I wrote ooh, about 10 or 15 years ago I can't remember the exact date but um, there's a scripture in Habakkuk that says, Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, where it says, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Um, during a time when, uh, long before my wife and I got married, I had been in a number of relationships and I was tired of doing the, you know, makeup and breakup and makeup and breakup scene. And I um, took some time off to kind of have a conversation with God of uh, who I really want to spend the rest of my life with, who I want to have a lasting legacy with. And um, I was, I was uh, inspired or he inspired me to write a list of everything that I wanted in a mate, who I want to spend the rest of my life with. and had a long three page letter of all these high achievements and superficial things and everything. And then he said, now judge yourself against that list. And I started realizing that these are, are, are non-important things when, I, when things get really tough, when things are looking to go into, um, when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, are, are you really going to care about what kind of car someone drives? So um, I went into uh, deep communication with God and I talked about some of the, the things. I wrote down the things that are that really mattered um, as far as from a heart, a character, um, a quality perspective person. And I wanted in my life um, of just having fun and having conversation when our kids are grown and we have grandkids and those sort of things. I want to have that type of conversation of somebody that can have my love and support after those years. And after I wrote that list down, it's amazing that after I wrote that list down, I knew exactly what I wanted for someone to spend the rest of my life with. Lo and behold, um, my wife <laughs> comes along. Well, actually, we had been knowing each other for some years, but we happened to go out on our first date. And I promise you, I wasn't trying to like her. Um, not, saying, <laughs> not like that, but it was just an innocent uh, uh, platonic date. And um, as we were on our date and we went to the restaurant to have, you know, we went to a movie and after the movie we went to have conversation and everything to get to know each other. And it was amazing because everything that was on that list 
I swear, I just knew that she had just stole it from my house, made a copy of it and just recited from because it was everything that I was looking for um, down to the point of, I wanted somebody that uh, knew my history and background from my own neighborhood. She lived two blocks away from my house and we had never known each other. Um, we went to the same high school, never known each other. I moved to another neighborhood. She was four blocks away from me. We never crossed paths. We, we, there were so many things where it was divinely inspired, where it's certain things where um, God had her prepared and set aside for me that this was my wife and something that it wasn't until I asked for it, it wasn't until I could have it written down that I couldn't understand, that I couldn't receive until I have it, had it written down and I asked him. So once I asked him and had that conversation with him, he just said, it's about time. Here you go. It's revealed and had it already aside. I say that all that to say, now that's the cute and fuzzy part, but then there's a scary part where I'm sick and my wife is seeing me um, hard to breathe with uh, Corona, having a disease that's, that's taking millions of people that are um, short of breath, uh, high blood pressure, older age and everything. And it's, re it's really scary. So I can see her going through so many things um, during this time, but she, during this time, she's being supportive. She's being my rock. She, you know, where a lot of people are, are panicking and, and going through so many, um, um, characteristics that aren't themselves. Uh, during this time, my wife is being, um, not only mommy to the kids at this time, but also being a support. She's being my lover. She's being my friend. She's being my, she, instead of me praying over her, she's praying over me. You know, um, she during the time at the, during this time, she was um, having lots of issues with um, other family members that were um, having other things going on. But she was not she was handling so many things with so many avenues and that that's I appreciated so much of her being all right. Yeah. You want to talk about your testimony? Babe? Sure. All right. Uh, so my testimony is basically about um, managing loss and um, where do you go from that point and April 13th of this year I lost my sister who was like my twin and it was one of the most difficult things I had to do in my whole life and one of the most difficult experience. And I want to share my testimony because the night prior to my sister's passing, I remember getting up at like three in the morning and being ushered to pray. And I was so tired and I'm like, God, I'm tired. So, you know, I woke up anyway and I'm praying. And I'm like, I don't know what this is about. And I got up and I said, God, just look over my family. It's a pandemic. You know, I don't know who might be impacted right now. And I went to sleep. And the next day I got the call. My sister passed. And by the time I made it to the house, she was already gone. And I remember being angry because I'm like, God, you woke me up. I prayed. Um, what happened? Why is she not here? And, you know, I kind of sat in that anger for the rest of the day. And I remember going to bed that night. And, you know, the way God communicates with me, it's usually vision. It's not necessarily word, I mean, a voice. And I got the vision of John 14. So I'm like, okay, let me get up. And I got up, got my Bible to look, to see what's going on in John 14. And that was a scripture before Jesus went into ascension. and. He's talking to his disciple and he's telling them, you know, um, uh, I'm going to leave the comforter with you so that um, whatever your experience is, just know that God is still with you. And I came to the realization is that the night before when I was awoken, it's just God showing me that he's going to be with me through this experience because he knew that was one of those experiences that would be very very challenging for me to handle so once i came to that realization it made it the grieving process not as painful not that there weren't difficult days but it wasn't as painful because it's a reminder that 
God is always near. And no matter, you know, we don't know the reason or why, but just know that God is still in the midst. So after her passing, um, I had to get to a place where I'm like, okay, God, I have to face my own reality and understand that debt is inevitable. So what do I do now with my life or how does this change me? And kind of try to find my purpose and what is God purpose for me moving forward in my life. And that took me to first Peter four and eight, where God talks about love. And um, I think first Corinthians 13 and the last verse 13, where he talked about um, there is fate and there's hope, but the greatest gift of everything is love. So um, my focus now is just to love people because love is healing and forgiveness is important to have now because we don't know what tomorrow may bring. So the greatest gift from this loss is to live a more spiritual life, to live the life that I feel God wants us to live, to express love because you, you know, we may not be the next president or whatever, but I believe no matter our station in life, we can still have impact and love is the greatest impact. Definitely. Um, just to reiterate and just to finalize that thought and testimony, um, you know, um, that um, during that time of loss, we also put so many things in perspective. There's been so many times where we've had conversations and reflection right now. I think one of the main things during this time, during this time we've had quarantine, but we've also had time to reflect over what we want um, our next 50 years for each other to be mm -hmm. and our next 150 years for our generations to go. And we're looking to um, pass on those lessons and those learnings to our legacy Absolutely. And, we, and we're and we're pur purposing ourselves and our families to um, gear ourselves toward legacy so um, one of the things that we're um, constantly doing now is um, talking to you know um, the rest of um, Nordia's side of the family my side of the family as far as um, keeping up family traditions and legacy and uh, not from a um, fam from ma family perspective but also from a Christian family perspective where uh, we're doing so many things to keep that legacy and those traditions together um, it's, it's been we're, we're doing so many things to keep in memory our sister uh, we're keeping things in memory so that though our traditions so our kids can remember it and pass on to our grandkids and we just want to make sure that we're, we're making those uh, messages of of keeping together love to keeping together a message of trusting God, holding on, keeping keeping focus on those main things. Because even though in the times of of calamity, chaos, and all those type of things, um, with my portion, you have to write that down ahead of time so that when crazy things happen, you have something that's grounded that you're grounded to that you can keep on during that time. But also making sure that you can keep connected within um, that legacy and making sure that it's rooted in love, so that way. Um, as time or as events or as those fears come around you have that love and have that connection to kind of build you and hold you grounded together because if it wasn't for the love that if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for the writing down I wouldn't have uh, met my wife and God wouldn't have allowed that for me it's uh, something where I had that conversation way back when where he knew this was going on but then there's all those different things where now um, there's things that we just couldn't understand or, or, or expect, and we don't know the answers to all those things. Absolutely. But during this time, we're trusting God, we're believing in God, and He's been keeping us um, comforted. Uh, not every day, because um, there's sad moments, and sad is okay. You know, um, there's going to be some 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 tears, but we've been made last for a day, but joy comes in the morning. We trust that, and we know that we believe that. Um, there's been so many angels that have come along in our life that um, we have to be thankful for. We just can't um, consider that as a coincidence. We're thankful for those divine angels that have come along to um, just be there for a listening ear, a supporting hand, a, a supporting word. And we're 
really thankful for God delivering all those different type of reminders and angels in our lives. Is there anything else you want to say? Love now. Love now. <laughs> Love now. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving to my church family. I truly love the holidays, but I do think Thanksgiving might be my favorite. There's really no hoopla to it, and it's just that awesome reminder for us to give thanks for all that we have and all that we get to do. It's a time to be thankful for our friends and our family. Uh, I'm thankful Jesus is in charge of my life and he's taking control over everything. And I'm thankful enough for not being in this alone. 2020 has been a tough year for tough year for me and an ever-changing year. I was a little spoiled in 2019. 2019 was so amazing with my retirement and then trips to Florida and Texas. Then we flew to England to visit our daughter Kimberly and her family and traveled all over Europe for a few weeks. In October, we went to Alabama for our youngest daughter, Kirsten's wedding to John Lucia. It was a beautiful beach wedding. And then for Christmas, we went to our oldest daughter, Kendra's home in uh, Austin, Texas, and visited her and her family. It was amazing. All six of our kids were able to be there at the same time. And, uh, and it was really our first time to ever be away for the holidays. So we had a good time all being together. We definitely partied hardy for the whole week and just enjoyed family time. Then came 2020. Andrew had torn his meniscus in Texas. 2020 therefore brought surgery and lots of TLC. Mid-March, just as COVID was beginning, to explode, Andrew had a pulmonary embolism followed by multiple heart attacks, bringing his life to an end on March 18th. After 43 and a half years of marriage to now be on my own was a huge change. These were many things I had, there were many things I had never touched, especially the financial world and that of the fix-it tool world. Andrew was a handy Andy he really truly fixed everything in our home, but he left our finances in quite the mess. Praise but God, my children told me that I needed some help. God provided the right people to guide me and get me on track. Now, eight months later, I have made it through. I've gone through probably 60 boxes of papers looking for my will and titles to the cars, all those important papers. Next, the struggles of Social Security and dealing with them and getting that all in order was another gigantic struggle, as well as the refinancing of my home. That's not quite finished yet, but hopefully soon. And I've been attempting to get my basement and attic back in order. Huge, uh, it's just a huge deal or <laughs> huge mess. <laughs> Phew, it's been a lot of phone calls, paperwork, grunt work, but slowly but surely, I am forging ahead. Being that it's Thanksgiving, I want to just say how blessed I truly am. I'm thankful for my family. My kids have all been so supportive in helping me through all of this. They have helped me laugh and smile. John, Josh, and Katie probably played a gazillion games of hand and foot and 500 during the heavy duty COVID period. I think I have a lot of my dad in me and this truly helped me to relax. They've helped me navigate this crazy computer world. Yikes, my poor kids. And they have stuck by me with meals, a huge garage sale, some travel, and just general support. The other family that's been more than amazing to me is my brother, Gary. He's a stockbroker and he lives nearby. He's helped me regain control of my finances and helped me, help me be confident that I can survive and make it all on my own. Gary's been my go-to person as well. He helps me with little things around the house and as well, he um, is just there to answer all those general questions too. I've truly been blessed with friends and family that have called me on a regular basis, prayed for me, sent me uplifting texts and messages and dropped by with treats and meals. One even sent me a devotional book that's really helped me keep my head up high every day. I have truly been blessed by my community of family and friends. 
thank you, everyone. Jesus, you have truly been there for me. I know I have been blessed beyond measure. Good morning, everyone. I, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to our story. Uh, we, uh, we don't have anything written down in advance, so this is going to hopefully come from our hearts. And uh, it's just our prayer that God uses our story um, uh, to speak to you. I'm Betsy and this is Will. We have three kids and um, some of you know our story and maybe those of you that don't will just share a little bit. Um, in November of 2015, my mom was diagnosed with endometrial cancer and uh, began treatment for that. Uh, it was really hard, her treatment on her. Me and my siblings uh, began to become caregivers to our parents and began to realize how uh, or my dad's health was becoming as we started to having to take care of them. She survived treatment and ended treatment in November, or excuse me, August of 2016. The week after her treatment was complete, um, we had taken our oldest daughter, Abigail, who was 17 at the time, for an MRI due to pain in her knee. Uh, that night, the doctor called and she was diagnosed with a rare bone cancer called osteosarcoma. A week later, she began chemo, uh, and our family was torn apart. Things changed. Things changed a lot. We um, we had um, a completely different vision for our home and our family. Um, honestly, up until this uh, five years ago, we lived a very charmed life. We met, got married, uh, we just uh, had three beautiful kids. They were involved in the plays and sports and academically um, doing very well. And we just had this, this vision of what our future was going to be for our family that uh, suddenly it was torn away, torn apart. Uh, her treatment was very intense. Uh, her cancer hasn't been studied since the 1970s. So these chemotherapies actually have are the absolute worst that you could give a person. The side effects are horrific. The long-term side effects uh, for later in her life are horrible. There, we would spend three weeks a month in the hospital with her, Will and I. Five days a week. Five days a week. We'd come home on the weekends. Uh, she'd be getting chemo all those days. Will and I would sleep on the floor in the hospital, taking turns, one of us at home. My parents were able to help out. My mom was recovering and the other two kids were shuffled back and forth between home and my parents' house and sometimes Will's parents' house. I think the hardest part during that was knowing that we weren't taking care of our other kids, uh, but we were doing the best we could, but we were smart enough and loved our kids enough to know that we, we were letting them slip through the cracks. Because treatment was so intense, on uh, days off we were at, it's called Kaiser Center, it's in Hope Hospital in Oak Lawn. That's the cancer center for kids. We would spend hours there. I would take her two days a week for appointments. Uh, Anthony is our son. He was 11 when she was diagnosed and Isabel was 15. They gave up all social activities. Anthony gave up baseball by their own choice. Isabel gave up uh, her social life, gave up soccer, just because they knew that our family could not sustain itself with one more activity. Um, during treatment, when she would be home, when Abigail would be home, uh, there were days you couldn't even make a noise in the house or walk too hard because just the vibration of the floor would make her throw up. Um, she was on very high dose anti-nausea medications, but couldn't s see enough to read because the chemo uh, affected the brain. She couldn't concentrate on school. She wasn't able to attend school because she wasn't able to go up and down stairs because the bone cancer had weakened her leg so much that she wasn't allowed to bear weight. She wasn't able to shower by herself, use the bathroom by herself. She became totally reliant on Willa and myself and eventually the other two kids had to help out with her as well. Um, when she would go home, she'd be on IV fluids, so I'm a nurse. It wasn't scary for me to hook up my daughter to IV fluids to her port, but that was a lot for Will to learn, all the new medical terminology. 
Um, and because her chemo was so hard, there would be days where she had absolutely no infection fighting cells. We had to protect her from the outside world. We had to change our clothes when we came in the house. No shoes were allowed in the house. Visitors weren't allowed. Uh, she couldn't go places because of fear of getting an infection because she couldn't fight it off and it could have killed her. As treatment went on, the next, after a series of chemo, she had to have a surgery on her leg to remove the tumor. That involved removing over half of her tibia, which is the lower shin bone, and replacing it with a cadaver bone. She could not have a typical implant because we discovered she had a severe nickel allergy and would have had um, an anaphylactic reaction to a metal implant, causing her to lose her limb, which we were trying to avoid. Which ultimately ended up yeah. losing. Uh, after surgery, she was casted from her toe to her hip in a straight cast. She wasn't allowed to have her leg down for more than 30 seconds at a time for about six weeks. Will and I would have to carry her leg while she walked on crutches so she could go to the bathroom, so she could sit at the table, move to the couch, go to bed. All this while she, her body is extremely weak from chemotherapy. Um, when the cast was removed, the day the cast was removed, she, and she got her new brace, which also had to keep the leg straight and had to be elevated, she started chemo again. That's the normal uh, treatment for osteosarcoma. The brace itself caused her to have a wound on her foot, so we were dealing with that. And about two weeks after her um, cast was removed, my mom called and said that her cancer had returned and it was metastasized and um, they were gonna start treatment for that. Which meant then that the other two kids could not go to my parents as much because my mom would be in treatment too and we wanted to protect her. So that was 2017, the beginning. Abby's treatment finished in June of that year and about two weeks after her treatment finished, she developed an infection in the leg that she had had the limb salvage surgery on. All the while, my mom was still in treatment and getting sicker and sicker, and my dad's Parkinson's was getting worse. Abby had another surgery on her leg to remove, hopefully remove the infection. Um, and then we thought, oh, maybe we can start a normal family life, the five of us. She's done with chemo. She had the infection removed. She can bear weight on her leg again. But normal wasn't something that was easy to come by again. Normal <laughs> was what the um, doctor said the first day that we were in the office and they had told Abby uh, about Abby's diagnosis that, um, that we were going to have a, a new normal. We've heard about that in the news lately but it meant something profoundly different to us. And it made me mad at the time. It's, in fact, uh, it's something that I struggled with for the last several years, um, ever since um, our, our family changed. I didn't want the new normal. And, um, and I, I was angry, I was angry at God. I was, um, there were days that I was just profoundly sad. There were days that I, I didn't have empathy for other people. I, I couldn't relate to other people anymore. Um, I felt like the only people that we could relate to was at the Kaiser Center because the doctors and nurses, they understood what was going on in our lives and uh, um, so did the patients and their parents. But So I, I isolated myself, very angry at God. Um, at times though, very close to God, feeling His presence and, and then very sad and then angry uh, again. Uh, to sum it up, it, it's not your typical testimony. It, um, I, I found a closer walk with Christ in the brokenness, in the hard, in the pain and suffering. And, and it's still broken. <laughs> and it's, it, it's, this isn't a Hollywood, uh, our life isn't a Hollywood story. Everyone didn't live happily ever after. We have no idea 
what's going to happen with our daughter. Um, but through that, uh, through that, I realized that we're all going to die, and and that's okay. In fact, it's not just okay; it's it's beautiful. It's what we're all working for as believers. This world is so temporary; all of our lives are. Um, but eternity with Christ in heaven, that's gonna be forever. And it's gonna be like this world, but perfect. And all the pain and suffering will be gone. And, and we'll be at peace. So uh, for me personally, that was realizing the sovereignty of God and realizing that he's in complete control. And losing that control myself was really hard. Realizing that I can't control any of this. I can't control my wife's pain. I can't control my daughter's suffering. I can't control um, seeing how this impacted my kids. But God is still in complete control and, and he's sovereign and he has a plan for our lives to impact others, whatever that may be. So I was thinking of throughout the last... Well, let me say, as we were just like, you came to that realization we both kind of did and we were coasting. Abby was in college but then the infection returned and she had to have the entire implant removed. She had another surgery, had to walk with her leg up again and then she was re-diagnosed with cancer again and well, we went through it all again another year. Yeah. And then in the end she ended up losing her leg. Losing her leg. So it just went on and on and I guess well, that's that's the point that we're I, point that I wanted to really make is that life is hard and sometimes it just never ends and it's not it, it, it's not a Hollywood movie. There's not a critical incident and then resolution and everyone lives happily ever after. Sometimes it stays dark for a really long time. Yeah, we're not out of it yet, for sure. But what has God showed you? Well, I like this verse in Habakkuk three sixteen. My I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I think of that as what's going on in our family. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And just like Habakkuk, there's days that my heart pounds and with fear and anxiety, my lips quiver and the verge of tears, my bones ache, my legs can't even barely hold me up. But each day I am given the grace, just like Habakkuk, even though I don't like it, even though I don't understand it, and even though I know he could, God could, take it all away. He's not, and that's okay, yet I will trust him. I choose to trust him daily with a ton of evidence to the contrary because then I know his presence in the middle of this pain. I trust him even though I don't like what's going on. I know he will never fail me or my family, but in the midst of it, I choose to be joyful in the darkness. I some trust that he's gonna use this story to bring him glory somehow. And that ties into while you know we're completely different people and we live in the same house, we, we have very different stories even though we went through the same experiences. But for me, Colossians 3 specifically spoke um, to my heart throughout the last five years and I, I, I have a terrible memory, so here we go. Um, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. This is the important part. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So when I became a believer, I died to myself and I became a new creation in him. And, um, and my real life is hidden in him. So no matter what circumstances we're going through in our lives, good or bad, it's not really my choice and it's all about God and his plan. I have no idea. Um, how God's using our story or our family story, but I trust him and I know he is. And that brings me great comfort. You had mentioned earlier too that it's not just a one-time death, like there's been through this process It's daily. every day, right. There's things we realize about ourselves yeah. that have to die. Yeah, I didn't. It, we we didn't come to these conclusions as a point of, in a point of time that's just completely changed us forever, and we always adhere to this and or believe this. Some days we wake up and we feel crushed and we forget all about it, but God constantly reminds us, 
and he constantly brings us back to him and to, to what we were talking about. And that, that peace in knowing that God is completely sovereign. We were talking about our favorite question and answer from the Heidelberg Catechism. It's come up throughout our marriage for the past 25 years. Do you want to? Uh, yes. What is my only comfort in life and in death? Well, don't come on. <laughs> that I am my not memory. my own, but, but belong body and, body soul, and soul to, to my, my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And that's kind of what we wanted to sum up our testimony uh, with is, is that um, I'm not my own. He's not his own. Abby's not ours. And we've had to come to terms with that as well. And when you do and, and you work through those things with, with Christ, uh, you, you, you find peace and, and the sun does come up. Yep. And some days it doesn't and that's okay too because you know there's another day. That's right. My name is Sharon Ruane and I've been a member of Living Springs for 38 years. It used to be called Homewood Reformed Church. And I've been saved because of Coffee Break um, with Connie Baltima for, for 41 years. And for many, many Thanksgivings, I shared. And it's been a long time since I've shared. Um, the last sharing from my family was John um, giving thanks for his lung transplant in 2007. And even though he's not here with us today, um, physically, I know he's looking down. You know, I speak to you today from my heart. I. Um, have a painting in the prayer room here at Living Springs that shows a wounded and bleeding heart. And I think we all can relate to that heart today. And when I had that vision, I saw God's hands come and hold my wounded heart in his hands. And I want to tell you, my family, that he does hold the wounded heart, your wounded heart, the wounded hearts in this nation in his hands. There are pictures being uh, shown right now uh, from my Israel mission trip, the paintings that I did uh, on the Israel mission trip. Um, I was there for a whole month. And as you know, I'm a prophetic artist and I travel the world doing uh, art for the gospel art in the gospel and I was there for a whole month and I came back on the 15th of March and I came in from a, such a successful and anointed trip to the day before the airports closed and all life shut down and so you see a trajectory that goes way down. My brothers and sisters, those who know me, know that I am an extreme people person. People wouldn't even come into my driveway because I had been out of the country. I was isolated, as many of you were, but I have no husband, my husband's gone, and um, my ministry completely shut down. Um, fellowship was eliminated. Social contacts, even, even phone was shut down. I lost many friends because of politics. Even my very best friend said she couldn't talk to me anymore because she didn't like the, the, uh, the, my politics. I found myself spiraling down into a terrible, terrible darkness. And I didn't know what I could do. I started having dreams about suicide and dreams about being a curse and, and cursing everyone I know. My, my daughters in Texas, I, 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 I couldn't see them. I couldn't see my mother because she's old, old and they, couldn't see anyone <laughs> and I, I was traumatized to the point of constantly be wishing I was dead and I finally went to the doctor 
and I got an appointment with the uh, doctor and I told him how I wished I was dead and I'm thinking of, I'm constantly dreaming of suicide and constantly dreaming of, of uh, being a curse and not a blessing anymore and being abandoned by God. And the psychiatrist said, well, you're in a serious depression. I said, will I ever get out of it? He goes, oh yeah, it's epidemic. It's an epidemic because of the lack of social contact. And he said, you can go to the hospital or you can go to a program in the hospital for two weeks. And I said, I will, I will, I will, I'll go. Friends and family, I'm telling you this because there are many of you that have experienced depression and have been hiding it. And I want you to know there is help. I put on Facebook, I was, I was transparent and I put this on Facebook. I got hundreds and hundreds of people praying for me and many said that they had experienced the same thing, thanked me for sharing because they were just frozen and afraid to even to say it, that they needed help. And then on Shine 89, I heard a song, and it was called um, Still Rolling Stones. It goes like this, out of the shadows, out from the gallows, dead men walking, but love came calling, rise up, rise up. I was dead, but Jesus called my name. I went to that program and I had fellowship. For the first time in eight months, I could be in the same room with someone that was talking about real life. Now, I don't know how many of them are Christians and I got to pray with several of them, but I was helped and I was helped by medicine. Miss International Missionary was helped by depression medicine. God is the healer and he uses healing prayers and love and medicine. And I am so grateful for what God's done for me now, I am going to have Emma come up because she's going to help me open this up. But I wanted to tell you that um, this, this, come on, dear, come on. This, this, this story is, reminds me of the story of Lazarus. He's still rolling stones. When Lazarus was sick and dying, Jesus stayed where he was and waited for four days. And then he came and he said to the people, roll away the stone, because Lazarus was dead. And the people said, but by now he stinks. He's been dead for four days, Emma, can you believe that? And they rolled away the stone and Jesus said, come forth, Lazarus, and Lazarus rose from the dead and then he told the followers help take off his grave clothes i was dead like lazarus and these people in the group and the doctor and then these others that prayed for me took off my grave clothes and i'm standing here today because he's still rolling stones he's still rolling stones in your life in, in your impossible situations. He's still rolling stones and I want to volunteer to help take off those grave clothes. We need each other. We need each other. And now I have to show you, I want to show you another picture. And this is an, an, another time that, that shows he's still rolling stones. I drew this I drew this because this is, this is how I felt. Like a, a tree that had been damaged and not 
not alive anymore. And all around me was death. And many of you who've had deaths in your life and trauma and sickness and illness may find yourself feeling the dead branches, feeling how dead you are. And this is how I felt. And now I'm going to have Greg turn off the lights. You see, this is a story of a mother tree in a graveyard, and all of her children are gone. It's another graveyard. This is the graveyard of Jesus Christ. And he's still rolling stones. God's rolled the stone away. And out of that tomb came the waters of eternal life. And this tree, because of Jesus, is planted by the streams of living water. Her leaf does not wither, and she bears fruit in season, and whatever she does prosper. prospers. And so I leave you with this hope this Thanksgiving Day, that no matter how you feel or how things look, because of Jesus Christ, there is hope eternal that starts right now. Yes, he's still rolling stones. And we are alive with the Savior that promises us life and life abundance. Happy Thanksgiving. I talk to you with a grateful and thankful heart. And I send out to you this blessing from God. In Jesus' name, I bless you and ask God to keep you in his abundant life, no matter how things look or feel, because he's still rolling stones. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that you have enjoyed this beautiful service, and uh, I hope that you continue to give thanks throughout the week. I love the words of Psalm 100 that says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever, and his faithfulness continues through all generations. God is good all the time. And uh, God has blessed us, and we're blessed to be a blessing. And uh, I want to just let you know that we, every Thanksgiving, we take a special offering to bless someone. And this year's offering is going towards our preschool. And our preschool has done an amazing job in this crazy season. There's been all kinds of limits and regulations to follow. And uh, Lonnie and her team has done such an amazing work. And not only have they done, kept the preschool going, but they have also opened to our community an opportunity for online learning to be done in person here at the church for those students who'd be all alone. And so that's a fantastic ministry as well. And so we want to give a blessing to them so they can keep the doors of the preschool open and continue this beautiful ministry. So if you're interested in giving, uh, you can do it right on our app. You can designate it to the uh, Thanksgiving offering for the preschool. And uh, I know that they would be incredibly grateful for that. So thank you for that. And I want to bless you now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. God bless you and have a wonderful Thanksgiving.